Maryland versus uh, Universal Elections Incorporated. Mr. Smith. Good morning, Your Honor. Judge King, Judge Agee, Judge Norton, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, on behalf of my client, Julius Henson, I thank you all for inviting me down here today. Um, and certainly, this case presents a quote from one of our middleweight boxers who now reposes in the cemetery in Baltimore. His name was Joe Gans, Judge Norton. And what he said was, is that uh, when you tie a man's hands behind his back and you hit him, it's really not a fight, it's a massacre. And that's precisely what happened in this case as it related to Judge Blake's decision to uh, grant a Rule 56C against Mr. Henson in universal um, elections. Um, Mr. Henson, as the court is aware from studying the facts, was uh, waiting to go to a state court proceeding in which he was charged in a criminal information with four counts of election fraud. This is while the federal case was pending under the CPA and Judge... Uh, By the federal case, you mean this case? Yes, Your Honor, this case. Um, being counsel in both cases, uh, you have to pardon me for being somewhat familiar uh, because counsel had to make certain um, adjustments and certain strategies based on balancing the two cases to determine what rights had to be protected uh, in each. So he was had a criminal case in the state court and he had a civil case in the federal court? Yes, Your Honor, he was where he faced a significant time of incarceration in the state case from the same sovereign, the state of Maryland. Uh, although they were different units in the state of Maryland, they were the same sovereign, that is the Attorney General's office and the state prosecutor, which under the Maryland scheme um, is not a part of the Attorney General's office, um, but obviously as a law enforcement agency, they both uh, had concurrent um, information available to them. In point of fact, if you... Where was he being prosecuted? What county? He was prosecuted in Baltimore City, Your Honor. Baltimore City. He was. Circuit Court of Baltimore City. He was being prosecuted that? in the Circuit Court of Baltimore City. He had prayed a jury trial. And that's, uh, and that's operated by the prosecuting attorney of the, of the Circuit Court of Baltimore City? No, Your Honor, the state prosecutor under the Maryland. State prosecutor. Yes. Okay. Under the Maryland scheme, the state prosecutor has jurisdiction over all election violations. Statewide. Statewide. Uh, with the permission of the state's attorney in each one of our 24 jurisdictions. If the state, if but that the state prosecutor is different than the attorney general, he, he is, Your Honor. He's okay. entirely different under the legislative scheme. What he does is that he roots out political corruption, election law violations, and there's one other uh, aspect of uh, his charge that he roots out. And your out. adversary here is the attorney general of Maryland, counsel. Adversary. My adversary here is the great state of Maryland and the attorney general, who under uh, the scheme of the TCPA is allowed to bring the action on behalf of the citizens of Maryland, uh, primarily because it's interstate um, commerce that deals with these automated calls known as robocalls. Uh, the problem that counsel was faced with here is that a the pending trial, which concluded in May of 2012, Mr. Henson, who was the only officer of the corporation, was brought before um, the district court and Judge Blake with the uh, possibility of incriminating himself under the Fifth Amendment when he was um, asked to come to a deposition, both on his own behalf and on behalf of the corporation. Um, It, it raises a Fifth Amendment question if that individual um, is pending court and there is an incarcerable penalty uh, well, that he can face. You, you, you're entitled to assert the Fifth Amendment. I am. Which, which is what your client did, right? That is exactly he what he did. asserted the Fifth Amendment, and, and the case went on. And the case and went you on. Wanted, but your complaint is, unless I'm wrong, is that you think that this case should have been stayed because the criminal case was ongoing. Yes, the record reveals that um, not only did I advise the district court judge in advance of the stay that there was the possibility of a, an indictment or criminal information, but I formalized it in a motion to stay to say that, um, uh, gee, there is no uh, harm, no foul if this case is kicked down the road until after the criminal case is litigated. The that decision of Judge Blake 
to deny you the stay is a decision that we review on appeal for abuse of her discretion. It is, in my view, I, and that's the, the, what I raised in my brief, that it was, in fact, an abuse of discretion. There was absolutely nothing, nothing at all, which would have allowed, um, which would not have allowed the court the opportunity to allow him more time to defend himself. Um, what happened in this case was... She exercised her discretion in that regard. She exercised her discretion badly in that regard. Um, what eventually happened is, is that she found, because Mr. Henson did not say anything, even after recognizing his Fifth Amendment right, that he, it is presumed that what he did by not doing it was knowingly voluntarily, the, the um, assumption was ruled against him by Judge Blake. And in her memorandum of an opinion, she says that. She says because he did not come in to give any testimony to refute the knowing and voluntary part of the TCPA. And she also indicated that this court has never um, found. She said you can use the, you can use the, the Fifth Amendment plea against him. Basically, what she said is, that you take the in fifth. In a civil case, right? And, and the ju jury's entitled to draw from that what they want. Well, she was entitled to draw from it from what she wanted because we never got to the jury. But if you got to a jury, yeah. you, you, in a civil case, right? Uh, you can talk about the other side taking the Fifth Amendment. Right. You can't do that in a criminal case. Right. But, but the something. jury trial was beyond, uh, or should have been beyond the time in which the state case was tried. And I must admit, being frank with the court, um, that he did go to trial in the state system, that he was acquitted of um, four, I believe, four out of the five charges, but he was convicted of the conspiracy um, to engage in not putting an authority line uh, on a piece of campaign material under 16303 of the Maryland election law. Of course, going back to Mr. Gans, God rest his soul, um, God rest. as of May 11th, you didn't have your hands behind your back because your client was found not guilty of four and guilty of one, and so and this decision didn't come out until May 29th, so you had 18 days in order to start fighting, and you didn't do it. Is that right? I, um... I didn't have 18 days to start fighting. Well, you were you're because, found not guilty on May the 11th, and the and the and the it, it, the opinion wasn't issued until May 29th. So there's a period of time which with which you could have or your client could have um, responded without any Fifth Amendment problem. Not because he's true. already he's already been he's already been found not guilty. The motions for summary judgment and the replies had already been into the court pursuant to the scheduling order. Uh, that, that's one of the problems associated with how this thing was fast-tracked through uh, in order to knock him out uh, without raising his hands. Um, the, the problem was here that he had already made his decision to assert the Fifth Amendment. There had been depositions taken. He had already made his decision not to answer the interrogatories. There had been questions posed by counsel for the Attorney General's office, and uh, he was laid bare um, by the timing that it took Judge Blake, who, by the way, did make reference to a Daily Record article on the very fact that he was, in fact, acquitted and took the stand. But that, that's sort of like a Monday morning quarterback. The horse was out of the barn and was already in the field by that time. Didn't make any difference under the circumstances. Well, I guess theoretically you could say, okay, he's found not guilty. We want to go and give an affidavit and refute all these things I had in my deposition, which I took the fifth on, I would guess. Well, the, the thing is, is that, the, and the odd thing about it, and I'll have to be very candid with the court here, um, is, is that there was an appeal even taken from that misdemeanor conviction, uh, which is currently pending in the Court of Special Appeals of Maryland. That's the conspiracy conviction? That is the conspiracy not to place a, um, an authority line on a piece of campaign that was material. A that's a misdemeanor in Maryland. That is a misdemeanor punishable by one year in prison and a thousand dollar fine as opposed to a million dollars uh, which he suffered in in this case along with Universal. Um, there's a, a large difference and even at that there was a sentence because of the problems associated with the general proposition of robocalls which Obviously, we attacked in this brief as it related to the constitutionality of the TCPA. And I didn't want to get too far away from that, but um, what was important, it seemed to me, 
uh, and it seems to me to be in violation of due process, is the abuse of discretion that Judge Blake took because she, in effect, determined that this was a palatable attempt to block the African-American vote in Baltimore City and PG County by sending these 110,000 calls. And by the way, he was acquitted of that, which he knew at the time that this opinion came out. So there was, in fact, um, in, in our view, and, and we have to pose it to you, Your Honor, Judge King, uh, Judge Agee, and Judge Norton, is that there was a, a bias which existed on behalf of Judge Blake from the beginning. Conclusions which were made, which were ultimately found not to be Part sustained by a jury. This is going to be substantially different between the criminal case and the civil case. You have a much lower standard in the civil case. Preponderance of the evidence, exactly right. There's no doubt about it, but uh, if you can't raise your defenses because you're facing incarceration or time in jail, uh, what are you to do? You, what you have to do is you have to figure as counsel, um, as counsel did, your strategy and how it's going to interpose. This, this was, a, mel uh, this was a, a case that was widely um, felt in Maryland, the tentacles of which had to do with who would control the reins of power in the state in terms of a gubernatorial election in 2010 for four years. Uh, and therefore, um, it, it went not only into Maryland, but it went across the nation as to how you deal with these robocalls and the interference with the sanctity of the home through a robocall. And uh, I'm at the juncture where I'm going to sum up, Your Honor, we have placed in our uh, brief at, at least, uh, and we haven't argued the TCPA, I've mentioned it, uh, it has, and, and we're still fostering it, of course, in all of our points in our, our Rule 12b motion, um, but we believe that this was content-based speech um, that was at stake here uh, in this book. First Amendment? I, I am saying that. I'm you're saying not giving it. That up. You're, you're, oh, I, I'm not giving that up for a moment. You spent most of your time talking about this today, the Fifth Amendment. That doesn't mean you would give anything up. Oh, I, I think if you if you decide against me, it might be the first case of its kind, and I may get to ride over to Washington, uh, which I look forward to doing. Uh, <laughs> since you helped me in that regard about two years ago when I rode over there. Uh, <laughs> So, so I'm looking forward to going back. They have like good meals over there. All star, of course. <laughs> well, they they have pretty good meals in the dining hall. So that's what I'm really looking forward to. Um, even though my wife cooks a good meal, uh, and and in essence, Your Honor, I, I'm not giving it up at all. I'm uh, strongly pu putting it before the court because I do believe that um, our theory, as it relates to content-based speech, is something um, that most courts in the circuits have not caught up with yet as a result of the complicated nature of the body politic and how people make decisions in terms of the counterintuitive um, psychological aspect of this case. Um, and, and of course... Why, why do you say it's content-based? Because, Your Honor, the, the message itself forces a person to act counterintuitively. The message which you have in uh, the briefs indicates that um, people can make a decision based on hearing that message. They can make a decision to come out to vote because they believe their candidate is being killed, uh, that is being murdered at the polls, and they can say to themselves, gee, if I had known it was going to be killed like that, um, I would have come out and voted earlier. Or they can say to themselves, well, I I'll just stay home, stay home and vote. What makes it counterintuitive, based on all the literature, all of the psychiatric literature, the psychological liter literature, the social literature, the business literature that we're bombarded with every day as Americans, is that they all send messages to us to buy their product, to do what they want us to do, and we have to make decisions based on either our rational mind or we have to make decisions based on our subliminal mind and what we believe is the adequate thing to do. It was a subliminal message that was counterintuitive. That is, you can relax. Don't have to worry about it. They've taken it back, President Obama and Governor O'Malley. And so we believe that that is a message that's content-based if you take off the authority line. Because what it says to the person who listens to it, and, and by the way, in this particular case, we don't know as a result of this pleading whether anybody really ever got the call. 
Uh, there's no affidavit in the record that I've been able to see from any citizen to indicate of the 110,000 calls that they received them. Um, and I'm going to reserve the rest of my time, whatever it may be, uh, for a rebuttal uh, to, my, to um, rebut my uh, honorable um, count, my honorable adversaries. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Mr. Groon? May it please the court. There's no dispute that the message that's involved here failed to comply with the Telephone Consumer Protection Act because it's fa it failed at its, at its inception to identify who was calling and failed to include an address or telephone number. And based on the undisputed facts in this case, Judge uh, Blake properly granted the state of, Mo state of Maryland's unopposed motion for summary judgment. Now, well, Mr. Smith says it was content-based, which I assume it was content-based with subject to strict subject to the analysis to strict scrutiny. I assume you would disagree with that. Absolutely. Uh, the uh, statute is not content-based. All messages are content-based. I mean, his argument essentially is the message is content-based. And because the message is content-based, that therefore it violates the First Amendment. Um, the statute itself uh, makes it, quote, it, it, quote, make any telephone call. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, depend upon the content of the message. It doesn't it depend upon who's making the message. Uh, and in fact, Congress, when it was passing the Telephone Consumer Protection Act, specifically found that pre-recorded automated messages were a nuisance and an invasion of privacy regardless of the content and regardless of who's initiating them. Uh, and because of that, the technical and procedural requirements of the Telephone Consumer Protection Act um, do not depend upon what you're saying or who's saying it. Um, regardless of, of who's saying it or what, what you're saying, you have to identify yourself at the inception of the call, and then you have to include an address or telephone number. Uh, none of that is content-based. I mean, there's absolutely nothing in the statute that's content-based, and Congress was very clear that they didn't want a content-based regulation with respect to the technical and procedural requirements. I mean, there are other sections of the Telephone Consumer Protection Act that, that uh, do relate to content. They relate to uh, telemarketing sales. Um, but the technical and procedural requirements, which are at issue here, have absolutely nothing uh, to do with the, the content of the message or who happens to be initiating it. Um, They've raised, because they can't dispute the basic facts, they've what raised... What kind of analysis do we use then? You say... Uh, no. uh, for the First Amendment? Yes. Uh, the First Amendment is an intermediate analysis. Intermediate. Yes, under Rock versus... Inter intermediate scrutiny. E yes, Your Honor. Um, you also. Yes, uh, under Rock versus... Uh, under Word versus Rock against racism. And you say Judge Blake got it right. Absolutely. Yes. Um, the Supreme Court was clear in, in um, Ward that... Uh, whether it's content-based or not is dependent upon were they trying to uh, prohibit the content of the message. Here, there's, there is no uh, attempt to regulate the content of the message. Uh, and because of that, uh, Ward says that you apply an intermediate level of scrutiny and that it passes constitutional muster if uh, it's narrowly tailored and furthers substantial government interests. And I know that the United States will also be uh, addressing this issue, um, but here, here it does. Um, both of those things. That's what they're in here for, to protect the statute, I suppose. Yes, Your Honor, uh, as specifically with respect to the, the, the First Amendment challenge to the statute. How come y'all just wouldn't give them a continuance of the civil case until they finished that criminal case? They asked for a blanket, indefinite stay of all proceedings. Um, and well, they, but they, but they, what they really, only thing they could really been entitled to was to get the criminal case behind them. Well, I think Mr. Smith conceded that they would still be asking for the stay today because of the, of the misdemeanor of the conviction. appeal. Well, but that, that, that's not behind them. That's what I guess maybe. That they, even though they were acquitted on four counts, they were convicted on one, I guess if the Court of Appeals think there's some defect in it, they could send it back for another trial. Maybe, I, but uh, I mean, lots of times you, you hold up the civil proceedings uh, to let the criminal proceedings go. Well, in, in uh, Cordell, the, the United States Supreme Court said yeah, that... Well, they don't have to, it's a, but, but, the, but most of the time they do, particularly when the same parties are involved. I mean, the United States, sometimes they've got civil proceedings and criminal proceedings going against the same people arising out of the same facts. 
they'll put the they'll put the civil stuff off and let the criminal proceedings go along. Well, in fact, right because you can run into discovery problems with people taking the Fifth Amendment. They got the lawyers have to make tough decisions, and the and the parties have to make tough decisions. Do you give up your Fifth Amendment right by testifying in a deposition or testifying in a civil trial when you got a criminal proceeding against you? Uh, but you know, you you say, well, that's abuse. That's reviewed for abuse of discretion, and it is. But lots of times the parties agree to it. The judge doesn't even have to deal with it. They just they just hold off on the civil side. Your Honor, when when this was filed, there was no criminal proceeding. Um, we filed the civil suit prior to the indictment of Julius Henson, and uh, we had an interest in stopping Mr. Henson from doing this in the future. Um, and we think that it is in the public interest to stop. What did you get? You, you asked for an injunction and damages. We did, Your Honor. Um, the, well, the the order only only ha only contains damages, but but we we did ask. You could, have, you could have said we don't want the we don't want the damages yet. We'll hold off on that. We'll we'll be satisfied with an injunction to, to keep him from doing this stuff until he gets his criminal case over with. Uh, the the you could have done that. The defendant certainly never offered <clears throat> to be sub right. to be subject to to an injunction. In fact, the only thing the defendants ever said, if you look at the defendant's motion. For stay. Was he still it's, in the election business? Yes. So he was, he was, that, that's what he does for a living. Well, but, the, but there's another election come up. They have elections every year up there, or every two years, or every four years, or um, the next, the uh, the last election, um, the the one that occurred last year was the was the last election. The 2012 election. Yes, Your Honor. The the election that's at issue in this case it was 2010. Correct. He, does he just do gubernatorial elections? Or is he is he he works in all of them. I think he'll, he'll handle anybody who, who will pay for him. In fact, the, the, uh, the, the candidate he was working for here, he had once uh, been quoted in the paper as saying was a Nazi. So, um, it, and, and then he was working for him in this campaign. So I think if, if you have money, um, he's willing to. Well, that's the way a lot of political consultants work, probably. Yes, but but I was I was just lawyers responding. Lawyers too. I mean, I, I mean <laughs> you know, lawyers. Not not on our that. side, Your Honor. I mean, that's right. So what it all depends on which side you're on, what side you need to be on. What would you say is the most specific rationale as to why Judge Blake did not abuse her discretion in permitting the civil case to go forward? The defendant uh, is required to show special circumstances. Under Cordell, uh, the Supreme Court said that in, in order to, to argue for a stay, you have to show special circumstances um, why uh, the action should be stayed. Here, the only thing he said, there, it was a two-page motion, motion to stay, and the only thing he said in substance was, um, there's a criminal investigation going on here. Um, there was no end. There, he wanted it to apply to all defendants and wanted to, to apply in, uh, forever. Um, and uh, uh, what Judge Blake did was say, no, I'm denying your motion. She did say that we can, uh, will address Fifth Amendment issues as they come up in discovery. And in fact, um, Mr. Henson never testified individually at a deposition. Um, we, we kept trying to get him there, but, but we never got him there. Now, he did testify as a, as a designee of the corporation. He didn't take the Fifth Amendment at a deposition? He, he did as a designee of the corporation. Um, but that was, that was their choice. But, he, but you know, if he testifies as a designee of the corporation, you'd use that against him? Absolutely. Well, sure. So he can take the Fifth Amendment. Yes, but, but the corporation could have designated someone else. He was the only officer, but they did have an employee, Rhonda Russell, who was also a defendant, who, who had immunity and, uh, and who, in fact, uh, and tested. And you all were investigating him at the same time. Well, we had, uh, you mean in. in you, could, you could conduct a criminal investigation and then call the guy for a deposition. Uh, and he takes the Fifth Amendment and you use the Fifth Amendment against him and use the fact that he took the Fifth Amendment against him in the civil case. Well, Baxter. Uh, I mean, that's just, uh, when, it's, when it's all the state of Maryland, it looks like it's a dirty pool. Well, they are, as, uh, as uh, Mr. Smith indicated, they're two different. Uh, we're the Attorney well, General's different offices. offices and, yes. But if you look at the pleadings, it says on both of them, it says State of Maryland. Right? It's two different correct, Your Honor. lawyers. But the party that you're representing and the party that the prosecutor was representing, that's what we call them in West Virginia, prosecutors, is the, is the State of Maryland. That's correct. You represent the state, and he's representing the state, and the state is investigating him criminally and prosecuting him criminally, 
and you're suing him uh, under this Telephone Act and uh, taking his deposition, and he, he has to take the fifth because the state of Maryland is also prosecuted. And yes. Any sir. lawyer with his salt is probably going to tell him he better take the Fifth Amendment because going to jail could be worse than getting damages against you or getting an injunction against you. That's that's certainly the case. Um, so it's a, it really puts you in a rock, between a rock and a hard place. The charges here, though, were different. Uh, the, the state the, the state uh, claim was uh, under a different statute, has different relief. Um, the federal claim is just the Telephone Consumer Protection Act uh, and. The conduct we were trying to stop, the, the state prosecutor wasn't trying to change future, well, I guess he would say he was trying to change future behavior. He was trying well, to punish. He was punish. trying to put him in jail. jail. Yes. <laughs> and he was trying to get a deterrent against everybody else. If he puts this fellow in jail for X number of years, that's going to scare somebody else off next election, and nobody's going to want to engage in this stuff, which is a laudable goal, maybe, if it's all about, it's a violation of the criminal law. He ought to be prosecuted. Certainly think but, so. To carry on a civil proceeding at the same time, that's what I'm getting at, which is what we have here. It's a the, civil... The, the criminal proceeding is the collateral proceeding. Here, you got this civil proceeding where he took the Fifth Amendment because he was being prosecuted. It's a civil proceeding... He said he, took, he, he, said he also took the Fifth Amendment in the interrogatories. Is that true? I believe that is correct. Okay. Yes. So you served interrogatories on him. Yes. And the interrogatories have to be filed, responded to under oath. Uh, and so... You know, you, if you're going to say something under oath, you either got to tell the truth or subject yourself to perjury or take the Fifth Amendment. To you. That's about the three choices you have. And he took the Fifth, I guess, because he was being prosecuted. Yes, Your Honor. Oh. And then you use that against him because the jury can infer that if they take the Fifth Amendment, you must be done something wrong. Although the evidence was overwhelming. I mean, all the evidence. And the fact that uh, the defendant didn't respond to... No, Your Honor. So how did how did it come to be denied? Was it just denied in a, in a pretrial order? How, how was it? Uh, the the judge issued issued an order and a memorandum opinion, um, and, and as I mentioned, there was only the the motion only was two pages. It it included no uh, evidence. Uh, he. He asked the court for permission to do that, but he never submitted anything. Was there a hearing on the summary judgment motion? No, Your Honor. Um, there also was no opposition. And although, uh, although you took position, there's no opposition because he wouldn't testify. There was plenty of other evidence that he could have used, although none of it was helpful to him. Um, he could have submitted documents. He could have submitted affidavits from other people. He could have submitted deposition testimony from people who were deposed. Lots of people were deposed. It's just all of the evidence was harmful to him. Um, the one gap is he is is he didn't testify. But all of all of the testimony that exists, if you read Rhonda Russell's testimony, who was his employee and clearly is favorable to him, all of the evidence here is against him. Um, I, it, well, let me ask you this question: Other than the motion to stay as filed by the appellant and your opposition to it, and the one paragraph order from the district. Court. Was there anything else that came up in the civil proceedings about the stay? There was only one other time, uh, and that was with respect. The only other time that, that the defendant raised it in the record was in connection with discovery against the corporation. And if you look at the, um, at the judge's grant of our motion for sanctions, she specifically put in a carrot and said that uh, Rhonda Russell could respond uh, the, the, the corporation could have Rhonda Russell provide the documents that we were requesting from the, from the corporation. Um, was she an officer of the corporation? No, she was not. However, she was an employee, and, and the corporate, she had access to the records that we wanted, and, and the court in 30B6 authorizes that? Yes. Yes, it does, Your Honor. Does it authorize a court to designate who the 30B6 witness will be? Uh, I don't know that it does. I, I, I believe you know that, what? I, I believe the corporation is responsible for designating who. Would you say the judge designated her? No. Uh, the, 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 the judge said the corporation could fulfill its responsibilities through Rhonda Russell. He, she wasn't ordering how they fulfilled their responsibilities. She was just saying, hey, you, there, there's someone here who doesn't have any Fifth Amendment right, um, and the corporation has no Fifth Amendment right, and the corporation can provide the discovery that the state wants through her. 
Um, I see that my time is uh, my time is up. If you if you have any questions about either the their liability or the other issues, I'd be happy to answer them. Otherwise, uh, I'd submit that that uh, the the lower court properly granted the state's unopposed motion for summary judgment. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Ms. Powell. May it please the court, I'm Lindsay Powell for the United States, and I'm here to respond to Appellant's First Amendment challenge to the provisions of the TCPA. And you're an intervener here? Yes, Your Honor. To protect the constitutionality of the statute? Yes, against the First Amendment challenge specifically. Um, I know the panel's already had the opportunity to, to, to talk about this issue a little bit, but there are two points that I'd like to make. Um, first, I want to reiterate that this provision clearly is content neutral. Um, it, it is not, its application does not turn on who is speaking or what is being said, but rather it applies to all calls that are made through this automated mechanism. Um, and we do know from the court's opinion in uh, Turner Broadcasting, uh, among many others, that regulations that apply only to one type of medium um, are not subject to strict scrutiny for that reason, that, that the legislatures are um, entirely uh, permitted to take into account differences among di different types of technologies, different media, in determining how they should be regulated and the appropriateness of doing so is particularly evident here. Um, as Congress itself noted um, in, in making findings and enacting the TCPA, and as um, courts have often remarked, uh, the Eighth Circuit in Van Bergen and the Ninth Circuit in Bland versus Fessler are, are particularly notable. Automated calls are, are unusually invasive and present a number of risks that other types of communications, including live calls, do not present. Um, and it's important to keep those features of the call in mind when um, undertaking the uh, required intermediate scrutiny analysis, uh, which is to say, when looking to see whether the um, provisions are narrowly tailored to serve the government's important interests. Uh, briefly, we have identified three important interests. Um, there's no dispute as to their importance. These are the protection of residential privacy, the prevention of um, the dissemination of misleading or deceptive information, and the facilitation of the enforcement of other provisions, including other provisions of the TCPA. Uh, we submit that these uh, disclosure requirements are narrowly tailored to serve all three of these purposes. I'd be happy to discuss that more. Um, I, I do want to draw the court's attention to um, its earlier opinion in National Federation of the Blind, which considered uh, a number of requirements under the Telemarketing Act, including a very similar disclosure requirement. And in upholding that provision under the rubric of intermediate scrutiny, the court observed that the disclosure requirement is, um, it was a very modest burden, and it had no difficulty in finding it narrowly tailored to uh, further several of the interests that are also implicated here. Um, although we reject uh, appellant's contention that, that this is uh, content-based or that it's relevant in any way that the speech here is arguably political, I would additionally note that uh, the Supreme Court has upheld disclosure requirements as modest burdens, even when they do apply specifically to political speech. Um, in Buckley versus Vallejo, and more recently in Citizens United, the court found uh, similar disclosure requirements requiring the speaker to identify uh, him or herself uh, to be uh, consistent with uh, even exacting scrutiny. Uh, so contrary to appellant's suggestion, uh, the, the challenge here is in, in no way the first of its kind. Courts have many times considered um, First Amendment challenges to disclosure requirements, both in the context of phone calls um, and even in the political context. Um, and uh, there are many examples, which I've just run through, in which they have been upheld uh, without any difficulty. So the uh, extraordinary thing would be to find that there's any constitutional infirmity here uh, rather than the opposite. If the court has any questions, I'd be very happy to discuss them. Uh, can't help us out on this Fifth Amendment stay <laughs> issue. Anyway. Unfortunately not, Your Honor. You can take the fifth on that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. We appreciate it. Mr. Smith. Thank you very much, Your Honor. Um, let me rise to the occasion of um, this Fifth Amendment analysis that was not made at all by Judge Blake as to special circumstances. I think my brother counsel indicated. Uh, she didn't, Your Honor. Uh, did. I'm asking you, did you ask her to make a special circumstances analysis? Um, I did not. I did not make her, uh, I did not um, presume to teach a learned judge the law. Well, I mean, other than filing this, the motion for, 
day, which doesn't say a whole lot, what else did you do? We had a telephone conference in which um, the state pressed Mr. Uh, Henson to take a deposition as well as to answer the interrogatories and Judge Blake specifically advised them that he had a right to take the Fifth Amendment and that she would not force him. Now that's, that was a telephone conference with the court. With the court, with counsel, on the telephone. Um, we believed that we had a safe harbor at that point uh, and that the motion for summary judgment under 56C uh, would not be granted because the judge confirmed what we believe to be the case, that he subjected himself to jeopardy by going in and giving this testimony. So that was the other thing that was done. David, did you ever file a memorandum with the court that set out the specifics of, of why the judge should grant the motion for stay? Did you ask for a hearing on, so that you could present oral argument on why the stay should be entered? That's what I'm looking for. Now, There's I nothing in the record to indicate that, okay. Judge Agee. Let, uh, let's just be clear about that so we don't waste a whole lot of time kibitzing about it. There's nothing in the record. What's in the record is this. We made it abundantly clear that we were facing an incarcerable trial uh, okay. before a jury. What, how, how yes, Judge Norton. How is Henson's case different than every other case that has a Fifth Amendment as a parallel criminal and civil proceedings? I mean, they're all the same. Right. And then they all, when there is a possibility that the state may use what is said against an individual under the Fifth Amendment, they're all the same in promoting due process. Yes. But, but you acknowledge that some cases they grant it and some cases they don't grant it. No, that, that's what Judge King said. I, I didn't say that. No, uh, but I'm asking you, <laughs> you will acknowledge that there's some misguided court out there that, that grants uh, the stay, and there's some misguided court out there that doesn't grant the stay. Right? Uh, I'm hoping that there's no misguided court that this uh, honorable right. panel, uh, that's right, has <laughs> jurisdiction over who will never do it again as a result of your opinion. Uh, and that's why I have rode all the way down here from Baltimore in the traffic uh, to ask you not to allow that to happen, at, at least in this circuit. Uh, well, I'm not going to change the standard of review, I don't think. Uh, I don't think you will. I'm not going to change it from a abuse of discretion to something else. It's going to be going to stay as a discretionary call. I, I think it needs to, because I think that's what the law is, and we all want to follow that. Right. We all just want to be, um, we want to give due process, and we want to have fairness in, fundamentally in our system of justice. And that's what didn't happen here. Uh, just one thing about this Rhonda Russell business, because I think I need to uh, put a pen in this, uh, the employee. Um, this employee was granted um, immunity um, by the state. Uh, she was only authorized to get from the website, the Universal Election and Politics Today website, those things which were a matter of public record. Uh, and that was it. That was when, when counsel referred to the carrot in the judge's opinion. Uh, she wasn't allowed to come in as an officer of the corporation and talk about. You're saying she couldn't have been the 30B6 witness. No, she couldn't have been the 30B6. She couldn't B6. have been the 36. It, 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 was, it would have been impossible. She, she got immunity and then testified against your guy. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's the way it, it happened. But what she did in her deposition, which you have in the record, she validated um, the issue as it relates to uh, our point about the content-based uh, nature of this particular call. And because the government didn't like it, and it's fairly obvious that they didn't like it because they came after him with everything uh, but a book of God. Uh, they jumped on him. They jumped on him pretty hard, both in the civil and the criminal um, basis. They went into his house. They did a whole lot of things that they didn't do to members of the political campaign committee uh, who actually um, tried to pay for the call but never paid for it. So Mr. Henson became the poster boy uh, for the lack of due process. He became the poster boy uh, for the intolerance in thinking what political campaign people do who are consultants and who merely give uh, advice. Uh, he was a guy who was an independent contractor who gave advice. And because he gave advice uh, and somebody had to um, dance the tune, dance to the tune, uh, he was the guy who um, received uh, the brunt of, these, of this situation. Thank you very much, Your Honor. I note that my time has ended. Thank and you, I Mr. do appreciate Smith. it. We appreciate it. We'll come down and uh, Greek Council and take a quick break.